Hi, I'm Steve Marzowski, Director of the Fifth Center for Archaeological Research at the University of Massachusetts at Boston. And today I want to read my paper, Memories of Mary Beaudry, Creating an Interdisciplinary Historical Archaeology. One of the standard assignments I give to my graduate theory class each fall is to prepare a biography of an archaeologist who has, they have found inspiring. More than one of our previous students has done their biographies of Mary Beaudry. Not much of a surprise, really. But with Mary's passing and the decision to celebrate her career as part of an SHA session, I was happy that one of her former undergraduate advisees, Kate Parker, who is now a grad student at UMass, would choose Mary as the focus of her biography assignment this past fall. When I originally asked to participate in a session that Luann and Sarah have organized, I wanted to share what might be best thought of as the early Mary Beaudry when we were both at Brown, her as a graduate student of Jim Dietz, while I was one of the original members of the Public Archaeology now Lab, now the very successful PAL Inc., before being accepted the grad program myself just before Dietz left. This period of graduate education was followed by the long and productive collaboration Mary and I shared while working in Lowell, Massachusetts. Me as the Park Service Supervisory Archaeologist and Mary as my co-PI of the Archaeological Survey, along with Rick Alia, who served as the project manager. During these years at Brown, I got to know Mary very well and we became friends. Then, as was always the case, Mary was a very generous person. Beyond our love of archaeology and history, we also shared a love of music that would remain so for both of our lives. In my abstract, I mentioned the importance of the interdisciplinary approach we brought to our work in Lowell, and that is still what I want to focus on today. But after reading Kate's wonderful biography of Mary, I thought it would be worth passing on some of this early history so that folks might know who Mary was and how she developed into the marvelous scholar she was. So let's start with Brown at the end of the 1970s when I first met Mary in the department as it was at that time. The setting was exciting as the presence of Jim Dietz and Marley Brown along with others such as the late Jane Dwyer who was the head of the Haffen Refer Museum of Anthropology, Peter Schmidt who was an Africanist who did historical archaeology, William Beeman, a sociolinguist, and the cultural anthropologist Louise Lanfear. You can see the influence of Bill Beeman in Mary Beaudry's dissertation that discussed, that focused on the folk semantic domains and early Virginia probate inventories that contributed immeasurably to what would later become known as the Potts article, or the multi-authored piece of Vessel Typology for Early Chesapeake Ceramics, the Potomac Typological System, that was published in Historical Archaeology in 1983. The piece, on which Mary served as the first author, followed by a distinguished group of Chesapeake scholars, Janet Long, Henry Miller, Fraser Nyman, and Gary Wheeler Stone, was truly revolutionary in its use of folk semantic domains, evident in documents that sought to capture the way pots were conceptualized and named by 17th century Chesapeake Society members. By using linguistic analysis, Mary was able to identify the terms that people of the day used to communicate to each other about everyday ceramics. Mary is certainly to be given credit for the research she undertook, but it is worth noting that she was influenced to take this route by both Dietz and Bill Beeman, and it reflected a very clear view of how historical archaeology was viewed by the faculty and grad students at Brown at the time. And that was as a mix of linguistic anthropology, cultural anthropology, archaeology, material culture studies, folklore, oral history, and a healthy respect for social history. And it was this vision of interdisciplinary research, or what some called at the time the synthetic approach, I think that's what Marley Brown called it, that was very pervasive at Brown at the time. Now, before moving on to this, the, the form of interdisciplinary research that was ultimately expanded to include a different set of uh, disciplinary approaches, I want to venture into what I would hope would be an appropriate and accepted bit of retelling of history. People play different roles in their professional careers, and my relationship with Mary was no different. 
She, for example, always served as the ultimate editor of most of the writings that we did together. And in fact, that is how we did it. I would write my part and Mary would write her part and then together we would work through drafts. But Mary often served as the ultimate editor and she was an excellent writer. And so I was very comfortable with that role. I brought a different set of skills, field experiences, theoretical tendencies, and as I will discuss, a different view of interdisciplinary research. Here I want to try and establish that Mary and I were intellectual and professional confidants. We shared our personal challenges, difficulties with different folks in the field, and gossip. Mary loved to gossip, and I have to admit, so did I. But my reason for qualifying what I'm saying is to offer some of the personal memories that Mary shared with me. One of these revolved around her choice of dissertation topics and her particular focus on documentary sources. I don't know when she told me this, but I assume it was while she was still in residence at Brown, but my memory says that it was later. But what she did say was that she felt she was being denied access to archaeological collections in the Chesapeake by what she described as a male-centered archaeological community. Now today, it would be easy to imagine this being the case. But what I recall was Mary saying she felt unwelcome, and for that reason she had decided to focus on documents rather than material culture recovered from archaeological sites in the region. Why raise such a point with Mary not here to speak for herself or to go down a road that was traveled so long ago? Well, my answer would be that Mary was, among many things, a feminist scholar, and I think her experience as a young archaeologist is something um, some continue to face, and so I offer this as evidence of the challenge she faced and how she ingeniously overcame them. This dis discussion highlights one of Mary's greatest qualities. She was open with those she worked with, and she always shared her take on things. I can recall many of the thing, many of these from our years of working together, and they speak to something that Kate Parker said about Mary in her biography, and that was that Mary was truly unique. I don't use that word very often to describe folks, but it was always so true of Mary. I finally referred to her as something akin to Frank Zappa, by the way she liked this. In what I wanted to, when I wanted to listen to Frank Zappa, there was really no substitute, and that was the same with Mary. There wasn't anyone else quite like Mary that I ever knew. I think that was one of the reasons we worked so well together. We were different and had different strengths, and we both appreciated what the other brought to our collective work. One example of this involved one of the stranger moments I ever had with my final advisor at Brown, the ethnoarchaeologist Richard Gould, who would say in response to something I shared with him about Mary, that Mary had a tremendous, he had tremendous respect for her. So one day I mentioned to him that when writing with Mary, she often seemed less comfortable than I was in providing a final synthesis. His answer still strikes me even today, some 35 years later. He said something to the effect, quote, well, that just shows the kind of cautious scholar Mary is. She doesn't want to speculate without firm empirical evidence to support her, end quote. My response was, uh, when it was when the conversation took a bit of a strange turn, but I would say an affectionate one. I said, so what are you saying, that I'm more prone to bullshitting than Mary is? His answer was, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. But don't stop, Steve. That's when you're really at your best. And he was correct about that in a very real sense. And that was another part of the relationship that I shared with Mary, our different roles in the process of writing and one that we were both comfortable with. Another facet of our relationship that we were both comfortable with was the complementary views we had of interdisciplinary research. Having both went to grad school at Brown, we shared a notion of what might be best described as a multidisciplinary research approach, where a host of disciplines, uh, the host of disciplines I mentioned earlier, came together to innovatively understand the past as a cultural experience made up of performance, language, the written word, and material culture. In our work at Lowell, we both came to appreciate the importance of the urban landscape as a form of material culture and as a critical arena of social performance. 
Mary and I brought complementary views of interdisciplinary research to the work we did in Lowell. Um, and it was expanded view uh, of what was possible that would shape the very nature of the project to what might be best conceptualized as a humanities or social based notion of multidisciplinary research that I outlined above, which was very popular at Brown at the time, we added a more science based notion of interdisciplinary research inspired by Scotty McNeish. I was fortunate enough to work with Scotty on a project at the Ting Mansion in Tingsboro, Massachusetts in 1980, the year Mary completed her PhD. The Ting Mansion was a 17th century house that was greatly expanded in the 18th century. It was purported to be the site of an early trading post, and Scotty had received a small contract from Wang Computers, a company that would revitalize the city of Lowell in the 70s and 80s as an early tech giant. Wang is perhaps best known today for the Wang Center for the Performing Arts in Boston, but during its heyday it purchased former Morris Seminary in Tingsboro that was also the site of the Ting Mansion. Sadly, the mansion burned down shortly after the purchase by Wang, and so they asked Scotty, who was the director of the Robert S. Peabody Foundation in Andover, Mass., to carry out some archaeology at the site, and I was fortunate enough to be hired by Scotty to carry out that work. During the summer season of work in 1980, I was able to find the remains of what would turn out to be the 17th century trading post of Richard Ting, but confirmation of this would only come the following summer when Mary, now an assistant professor of archaeology at Boston University, would carry out a field school at the site. This was the first time Mary and I would work together beyond a short stint when she and another grad student at Brown, Susan Gibson, would hire me for a project with high school students in Rhode Island that never really materialized. The Ting Mansion was an amazing archaeological site that was rich with folklore surrounding its later owners that included stories of ghostly apparitions, but neither Mary nor I really found time to write up much of the limited work I had done nor the follow-up work she had done with her students. But in a wonderful example of the legacies of collaboration, Mary would later have her student, Krista Barana, complete her dissertation on the combined work and collections that we had jointly collected from the Ting Mansion. Later, I would have the good fortune of hiring Krista to work with us at the Fisk Center, where she remains a central figure in our numerous research projects in Massachusetts, including the recently rediscovered original Plymouth Settlement, an NEH-supported project that, that she and David Landon have been directing. By the way, as I will note in just a minute, David Landon was one of the original grad assistants who worked with Mary and I in Lowell. Today, David, beyond his well-known work in zooarchaeology, serves as the associate director of the Fisk Center at UMass. While Mary was establishing herself at Boston University, I became Boston's first city archaeology archaeologist after finishing my own PhD at Brown. But before that, I had made an important move to the Northeast Regional Office of the National Park Service, where Mary and I once again found ourselves working together on the Lowell Archaeological Survey. So first I was the city archaeologist, then I became the National Park Service archaeologist, and then I would finish my PhD. To the humanities-based notion of multidisciplinary research that was part of both of our training at Brown, I was able to add a more truly interdisciplinary approach that was a direct outgrowth of my work with Scotty McNeish. I was fortunate enough to live with Scotty at his house in Andover for the month I worked at the Ting Mansion in the summer of 1980, and from that I experienced uh, and learned two very important things. First, that Scotty, a prolific writer, wrote with pencil and paper while he watched sports on television. I think it was soccer, as I recall. The second was the difference between his vision of interdisciplinary research versus multidisciplinary research, a difference that hinged on who was asking the questions. In most instances, archaeologists who worked with specialists in fields such as plant genetics, in Scotty's case, the genetics of early maize, or in palynology, ethnobotany, or zooarchaeology, these were specialists who carried out analysis of samples collected in the field by the archaeologists. In Britain, for example, where science and archaeology, as it was called in the 1970s, involved a host of specialists whose nickname revealed their particular specialties, for example, the marvelous soils and micromorphological scientist Richard McPhail, was known fondly as Dickie Dirt, or the mollusk analyst Richard Evans, known as Snail Evans, 
or the seemingly never-ending list of animal bone specialists, also known as bones. When I was fortunate enough to work with the British archaeologist Dominic Powlsland in the late 1980s and early 1990s, when I was myself a young assistant professor at UMass, I got to meet many of these illustrious characters. One very important thing I discovered, however, was that unlike the specialists who Scotty had worked with, all, who all played an active role in shaping the questions surrounding the origins of agriculture in the New World and planning and overseeing the sample collection on Scotty's numerous projects in Mexico and Peru, their English counterparts were not afforded this same accommodation. When Mary and I began planning the Lowell Archaeological Survey, we both embraced the notion of interdisciplinary research that Scotty had nurtured. Scotty would teach two years at BU starting in 1985, I believe, and, and as a direct outgrowth of that, we decided to include palynologist Gerald Kelso, who sadly also passed away this, this year after Mary's passing. Mary knew Gerald uh, well since they had been on the faculty at BU before he too joined the Northeast uh, Regional Office of the National Park Service at the same time I joined and we were able to work together on the Lowell Project. Gerald was a critical player in all of the work at Lowell as his combination of focus on both diet and vegetation reconstruction, which he had developed in the American Southwest, were adapted to the reconstruction of urban landscapes in Lowell. Although Gerald was working for the Park Service by the time we were all working together in Lowell, he had already developed a budding interest in urban landscapes working with Mary in Bo uh, Boston. So the transition to reconstructing urban landscapes in the backyards of boarding and agents' houses was set in motion by this earlier work with Mary. I continued to work and publish with Gerald when we worked together at Jamestown in the early 1990s, and he did the same with Mary on some of her projects in Massachusetts. The work that we collectively carried out in Lowell would provide an important model for interdisciplinary research in historical archaeology, and I think it would prove to be one of the most prolific collaborations in the history of the discipline, if I can say that. Mary was a great field archaeologist and also oversaw the collection of oral histories for the project. One of the benefits of the project was getting to work with David Landon, who I mentioned earlier. David carried out the zooarchaeology for the Lowell Project, and he would later complete his dissertation under Mary's guidance. David and Krista, who are both giving papers in this session, are just two of Mary's successful students. Kate Parker will be another of Mary's legacies, and this brings me to my final point concerning Mary, and that is that her amazing work that she did as a mentor to her students. Mary spent her entire academic career at Boston University and was an amazing advisor. I always admired her for her dedication to her students and never once did I hear her complain, as some faculty do, about the time she had to give to her students or how hard she worked in furthering their collective careers. I can still recall the letter of recommendation she wrote for Krista when she applied for a job she now holds at the Fisk Center in this letter, Mary noted that Krista's dissertation draft was the only one she had ever received that required virtually no changes. Uh, Krista doesn't really recall it that way, but I think we'll accept Mary's point. It wasn't hard to make a choice with such a recommendation, not only because of what it had to say about Krista, but because of, it was coming from someone one who cherished good writing and the need to communicate clearly. Mary was a wonderful writer, and it wasn't unusual uh, to find her contributions to edited volumes, both those she edited and those she had contributed to, as the best written pieces in the book. A good example of this was the piece she contributed to an edited volume on microhistory edited by James Brooke and Chris DeCourse. It was a piece on the patina that material culture brought to the identity of those who lived in the Spencer Pierce Little House in Massachusetts, a book and article that I use quite often in my graduate historical archaeology class. Like so much of what Mary wrote, it was clear and concise and theoretically sophisticated without the use of the jargon that often plagues theoretical writings. So that was the Mary Beaudry I knew early on. A great collaborator, skilled writer and editor, superb analyst and theoretician, and a true believer in historical archaeology. And her long, long devotion to the SHA is one of her great testimonies. Although her prominent role in the SHA meetings held in Boston in 2020, when Mary understood that her health was failing, something she confided in to me during those meetings, now make it seem melancholy, 
It nevertheless stands as a testament to her commitment and fidelity to both the practice of historical archaeology and the Society for Historical Archaeology that she did so much to shape. I will forever be grateful for the many laughs, exciting work, and good friendship we shared.